This sitting is resumed. Honorable Member for St. John. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to make a brief contribution to, to this debate. <clears throat> but before I start, Mr. Speaker, I want to, to thank uh, the good people of St. John for having the faith and confidence in me to be here again today. And I, I truly believe that, you know, in the words of that song, um, the goodness of God is following me. Mr. Speaker, this is interesting. I always try to look at how the work that we do in this place can benefit the constituents of St. John, and in this case, the young people of St. John. <clears throat> the Prime Minister, in, in her contribution, uh, I believe, mentioned this as being a tool of empowerment. And I, I too, want to attach those sentiments to myself because um, youth work is not something that is strange or foreign to me. And it is interesting to note that whenever the Barbados Labour Party is taking the, the reins of government, that persons within Barbados, particularly the young people in Barbados, are the ones who are empowered. So when, when I hear that um, the Prime Minister mentioned a tool of empowerment, I, I can understand. And, you know, we, we have changed the script in a positive way. Some of the cast, Mr. Speaker, um, would have moved and new members were added. But at the end of the day, proactive government still remain as a result of the Barbados Labour Party. And I, I mention the importance of this because I believe that we have a number of young persons in that constituency of St. John that is rising, by the way, that can benefit from this particular amendment to the Constitution. And when I mention the fact that whenever the Barbados Labour Party is in government, that our young people benefit and benefit tenfold, there's evidence to suggest that what I'm saying is true. In 1994, um, I was privileged to be a part of a ministry that was then um, under the, the stewardship of our current Prime Minister. And she introduced a program, the Youth Development Program, that benefited young persons in this country for a period of at least 14 years. And when I look at that particular time frame, it was a period when youth work in the Caribbean we were setting the trend, we were at the zenith in relation to what youth work constitute in the Caribbean. I was also present in those 10 years from um, 2008 to 2018 when youth work in Barbados hit rock bottom. And, and I say that without apology because things that happened during those 14 years as it relates to um, youth work, and, and I heard the member from the city refer to his involvement at that time and other members who came through during those fantastic years um, of, of, of 1994 to 2008. And we saw during that period uh, where young persons who reside or who congregate on the blocks were provided with a second chance. And I was intimately involved in the process so I can speak to it um, with a level of certainty because Project Oasis was one of those initiatives that was changing the lives and providing a second chance for those guys who are on the blocks. And, you know, I, I, I seriously believe that it was a travesty during those, uh, we usually refer to them as those dark 10 years, because you had a government during the period that had a youth manifesto. And today you cannot point to a single initiative out of that youth manifesto that materialize on the landscape in Barbados. So I say to you, I was there for the 10 years when we were at the Zenith, and I was there for the 10 years when we were at the very, very bottom. Um, we came again in 2018, Mr. Speaker, and again we saw the benefits to young people where one of the major things, the, the fees for university was reversed, where you had that 10 years where that particular government removed um, that from our young people. So. Again, the Barbados Labour Party coming to the fore, and you're seeing the change, the positive changes that can impact our young people across this country. Um, 
I, I have now returned, so to speak, to my roots, and, and I would have mentioned at a meeting that I'm there now with different shoes, and I'm seeing again the, the very, very, the vibe or the interest again in what is happening in, in youth work. Um, this would have started in, in 2018, and we have programs, for example, called the Pathway, um, the Pathway Program and Get Into Program. And these two programs at the ministry are focusing primarily on providing an opportunity for persons to be trained for the world of work. They're honing their skills at the ministry in terms of providing the necessary counseling, providing personal development training, that when they hit the world of work, that they move smoothly, the transition is one that is very, very smooth. What we're looking to do, Mr. Speaker, is to expand the program. Um, only Sunday night I was at an event and I was interacting with um, an employer and she was singing the praises of the program and the fact that when persons hit her business, they were ready for the world of work. Um, everything was in place in terms of providing that customer service. And, and these are the things that are happening in the youth development program. These are the things that are happening in the ministry. Um, one of the other programs that we're looking to, to rebirth is the School Leavers Tracer Survey. And, and this is an initiative, this is a program where at the end of every school year, the youth officers go to the secondary school for those persons who are exiting the school system to gather information in terms of planning. And it helps us in terms of the programming, what the young people are looking to do, what it is, or how can the ministry buttress whatever they're doing in order to strengthen their capacity going forward. And this is something that, like I said, is happening within the ministry. All of these programs we're looking to expand. Um, only this week, Mr. Speaker, we, we, we are looking at the possibility of starting a SAT um, tutoring program that is run by central government. Because we have a lot of young athletes who um, possess the skills and, and they're looking to go overseas to do scholarships. But the process of preparing them to do the SATs is being done in a sense at an ad hoc basis. We have maybe two or so individuals who are providing um, that training. But if you can imagine a youngster from the constituency of St. John whose parents do not necessarily have the means to pay for that tuition, then this is someone with skill sets who will fall through the cracks. And I have asked that we look at this program and ensure that this particular program is coming from central government so that everybody is now empowered. So when Prime Minister mentioned a tool of empowerment, this tool of empowerment is not only in the amendment for the Constitution, but it is running through my ministry in relation to what we're doing to empower our youngsters on the landscape. And in most cases, Mr. Speaker, by empowering our youngsters, we're also empowering community because it is also about empowering community. And you can imagine that um, if you look at the trend of sports and the fact that individuals who are involved in sports can lift the profile and lift communities. Um, right here we have um, a coach, Mr. Speaker, from in your constituency. And, and in, in, the, in the area of basketball, I would have mentioned before, Station Hill is one of those staples whenever you talk about basketball in relation to the success. And, and what that success can do is to galvanize the community to ensure that those persons who are actively involved in the sports continue in that vein, whether it be sponsorship, whether it be the uh, means of coming to support when they're playing. These are the things that this tool of empowerment will also read down to. And, and I want my young people in the constituency of St. John to understand that you know, when we come here, it is about them. And this today is about empowering our young people to ensure that all of the untapped talent, I constantly refer to the fact that we have a reservoir of untapped talent in this country, Mr. Speaker. And the onus is, part of, the, part of it is on government to ensure that we shine those diamonds that are coming from the rough. And I would have benefited from this individual being on the platform in the constituency of St. John, and we got rave reviews in terms of his performance on the platform in the constituency of St. John. So if not there in St. John, why not here as well? And my, my belief 
is that we have, you know, set something in motion where other young people, not only in St. John, but will gravitate now to politics, gravitate to being involved at a level that we have not seen before. Because the truth is that a lot of young persons are turned off um, about what is happening in politics. And to see one of their own reach this particular level, then I believe it can re-energize them and, and have our young persons coming through. I know at the ministry there's a youth parliament. And if you had to sit, Mr. Speaker, and see the interaction in terms of those youngsters, then you could understand that the future is really um, looking bright in terms of that. And to have one of their own, to have one of their own elevated to the status of what we are seeing now can only redound to positive in relation to how we go forward. Mr. Speaker, sports training is one of the other things that is happening within the Ministry of Youth Sports and Community Empowerment. And um, I would have mentioned and I'm hoping that by the end of this month or so that we can again get back to um, having sports on the landscape in an active way. Uh, a lot of NFs have been calling and asking when are we going to restart. And you know our teams are in competition outside of the country and we need to have or we need to move to a, a stage where practice and, and playing and getting involved again in competitive um, activity is um, par for the course. Mr. Speaker, I believe that a lot of our community projects um, in recent time I have asked that we move away from providing participants with certificates of participation and move to a stage where our young people have a certificate at the end of the day that would provide entry-level qualifications into the areas that they're looking to. Because it makes no sense to be involved in a program for three, four months, and at the end of the day, you have a level of um, competencies as a result of the tutoring, and all you're getting is a certificate of participation that means absolutely nothing. So we're actively looking at having all of our programs accredited so that when our young people complete these programs that they have something that is fairly marketable going forward. Um, the Youth Achieving Results. This is another program that is not really known um, by the wider public that is happening within the ministry. And we have performing arts where we take people again who are interested in the performing arts. We do um, voice training, we have instruments, and these guys are trained by professionals. Uh, we work in partnership with the, the National Cultural Foundation to ensure that we have tutors who are at a level that can really, really deliver. And we have seen success in terms of those persons moving from this particular program and getting involved in NIFCA. We have seen persons move from the, this particular program and, and being involved in music, in the music industry in a meaningful way. We have the visual arts, Mr. Speaker, which is a component of the same youth achieving results. We have persons get involved in um, different um, arts in terms of painting. Again, we have seen people move from there into, the, into NIFCA. We have seen people start their own business. And their parenting, um, Mr. Speaker, with our sister program, this is the youth development program, their parenting with YES. So we're providing an opportunity not only to learn a skill or to learn a discipline, but we're providing you with an opportunity then to move to the youth entrepreneurship scheme where you go through all of the rigors in terms of how to manage your business, how at the end of the day that you can be a successful entrepreneur. So this, this particular amendment today, um, Mr. Speaker, may be targeting a particular area but I see it as a move and a tool of empowerment, not only in this case, but saying to the young people in Barbados, this particular government, as always, when we take over the reins of government, the Barbados Labour Party, that your future is secure, that you can move from one level to the other level, knowing that the government of the day will hold your hand. And it is evident, like I said, in every single case that you can look at. Um, the community projects, Mr. Speaker, 
and, and this, this is one of the areas that um, we're looking to revamp. This is one of the areas where I've asked that we look at more entrepreneurial projects than projects that are just um, fun projects, so to speak. And I'll give you an example. Only two months ago in my constituency, there was um, a training project where 15 unemployed young females engaged in dressmaking. But why dressmaking? There, there are three primary schools within the constituency of St. John. And if it is the case that we can move these unemployed females to a level where they can manufacture uniforms for the three primary schools in St. John, then you can see where this project is going. Um, so projects of this nature, what we're hoping to do is to have that training program certified um, where persons can actually then um, branch out if they want to, to get involved in the industry, if it is the case they want to be totally self-employed to provide those kind of um, services to the three primary schools within the constituency of St. John. And, and these are the projects that I'm pushing that we should have again at community level where all of us can have um, interaction with the youth officers that, are, that is attached to the particular constituency and initiate projects that you believe can redound to persons being self-employed, persons becoming employers as well. So when this amendment is put in place, finally, Mr. Speaker, and we have persons who are 18 years old that can now um, enter these, these chambers to be involved in decision making at the highest level, I welcome it and I'm hoping that those young persons who are in sixth form or fifth form and looking to get involved in politics at a, a serious level will understand that government is paving the way in a meaningful way for them to get involved because um, oftentimes young people believe that you know one of the things we do is that we speak down to them and, and, and that is not necessarily the case. One of the planks that caused the success of this particular ministry that I'm in now is the fact that we kind of start from a bottom-up approach, Mr. Speaker. Youth officers, they go to the ground and they try to ascertain from the young people what it is exactly that you're interested in. And then programs are put in place because it is a failed um, attempt to go and put programs in place and expect the young people then to gravitate to these particular programs. But if programs come directly from the young people, that we are tasked to serve, then the success rate is always greater when we do that. And the, the results are there. Um, we have seen where over and over again that when you go to the ground and you get that information and come back and plan your programs, that the success rate is greater. Mr. Speaker, one of the things that we are looking at as well is to have a more meaningful relationship with um, the prison population that is within our target group. And in youth affairs, we go from 9 to 29. And I believe that persons make mistakes. And if they're in the, the prison system, then we should not turn our backs on them. There should be programs that are put in place. And I know that some programs are in place. But we need to have programs coming from central government that will provide an opportunity to reintegrate those persons who are in the prison system back into society. And one of the things that we're looking at is to see how we can nurture that relationship with the prison system to ensure that when those individuals who would have made mistakes and looking to recover and need a second chance, that government and the Ministry of Youth is providing that opportunity, whether it be training, whether it be counseling, whatever is necessary. We have about 32 officers who work on the ground on a daily basis. And those officers are expected to interact with those people who are coming out of the system and to do some tracking, to do some meaningful interventions. And if we can do that, I am sure that we will cut, uh, cut down on what is happening in terms of persons returning to the system. Um, and I believe that this is a program that we should trigger as soon as possible. And I know officers are actively looking to do that. In addition to that, all of the programs that we have within the ministry will have a tracking component attached to all of them. And when I say tracking, what do I mean by that? Um, you, you have projects, you have individuals who are involved in the process, 
and after they exit the particular program, um, by and large, they're on their own. And we're looking to change that. We're um, at a period of four months. Um, the officers will interact with them and find out what is going on. We will track them for a period of one year. And, and we will see what is the success rate in relation to those persons who would have exited the program, what we need to tweak, if what we're doing is actually working at the level that we want to see it happening at. Um, I mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, Project Oasis. And the, the last government, uh, the Democratic Labour Party government, would have shut down the program and changed the name. It has come back in another format, and what we still have is a relationship with those institutions that provide training. So you have persons who are unemployed and at risk, or what we call at risk, are able to source training programs at the Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic. They're able to source programs at the Barbados Vocational Training Board. And this is a, a, a partnership that is working well for us in terms of getting people into the program. So you have a situation, Mr. Speaker, where if it is a case that um, the entry level requirements for these programs are normally for CXCs, and you have youngsters who are at home or on the block, as we put it, they can now source those, tr new, those same programs through the initiative from the ministry. And, and, and this is called the Next Step Training Initiative. And, and those persons go into the program, Mr. Speaker, and they do exceedingly well. And I'm speaking again from experience, and I want to return to that particular project, Project Oasis. And we saw individuals who were laymen on the block. I'm talking about hardcore block men who would have gone to Palm Marine and completed programs, for example, the cooking classes. I know, for example, of one individual who came from a block and is now gainfully employed at one of the villas in Sandy Lane. And so when I refer to the fact that we are looking to unearth talent, when I refer to the fact that there's a reservoir of untapped talent within Barbados, I know exactly what I'm speaking of because I have been there, Mr. Speaker, and I have seen the changes in the lives of individuals who all they required was an opportunity and a second chance to do good in this country. So, Mr. Speaker, I fully, fully support um, the amendment to this constitution that would allow persons at the age of 18 to get involved in politics at this particular level. I believe it is something that um, can only benefit our young people. And every day, every day, Mr. Speaker, I go to work with one intention, and that is to facilitate the needs and aspirations of the young people in this country. I'm doing the same thing in the constituency of St. John, but those persons in that constituency made it possible for me to do it at the macro level. And I really, really look forward to bringing the necessary changes that we will see in the Ministry of Youth, Sports, and Culture to benefit all of the young people who are interested and even those who may be on the fringe that the staff at the ministry can get them involved into something positive. Um, there's a, a kind of mandate right now that we need to have um, at least 30 or so new clubs started in Barbados. And at some point in time, Mr. Speaker, I look forward to reporting that that target was met and that we're on the way to really and truly empowering communities through our young people. Um, that is the next wave of all that is good in this country. And I'm sure, very, very sure, that this government is doing all that is necessary, all that is necessary to ensure that none of them are left behind because the resources are there and we are going to make sure, um, we are going to make sure that everyone benefit. Some of the initiatives that I have identified here, Mr. Speaker, are coming on stream, in particular the, the SAT training because um, a lot of our youngsters um, can use that scholarship to move them and their family to the next level. And we do not intend to hinder them in any way. So if it is a case that this particular initiative is coming from out of central government, then I believe that um, there's no fear of persons not being able to take up that um, opportunity as a result of not having the finances to pay somebody to provide the service of them doing the SATs training. 
Mr. Speaker, um, I, I, I think that I have identified some of the things that are coming from within my ministry in relation to how we are proposing to go forward, to move our young people forward. And again, I want to um, emphasize the fact that if we accomplish this, if it is the case that we can empower our young people, then I'm sure that communities will be made stronger, and at the end of the day, it will benefit all of us as a whole. I am obliged to you. Honorable Member for St. James South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to start, sir, by thanking the good people of St. James South for giving me the opportunity to represent them again in the House of Parliament. And I want to thank them not only for their support, but for their active vote in the last elections. And part of the experience of that last elections was to see more young people actually motivated and activated, wanting to contribute in a meaningful way and participate in the election and participate in the democracy. And that is why this afternoon I stand to support the bill that is before us, the amendment, because I believe that in providing a method for young people who have an interest, who have a talent, who want to engage our political process, it must be encouraged at all costs. And therefore, I want to fully support what is being done. As was outlined by, the, by some of the earlier speakers, and I want to congratulate our maiden speech that was made by the Honorable Member for the City of Bridgetown, well done. And I also want to um, thank the new Minister of Youth and Sports for sharing the comprehensive program that the Barbados Labour Party administration has for youth in this country. I want people to recognize that we understand the absolute importance of bridging that separation that has been going on in our country where young people feel disenfranchised and separated from what is happening in Barbados and that we have to recognize that these are the young people who will be the new political leaders of tomorrow and if we do not engage them if we do not pull them into the system, if we don't give them a voice and an opportunity to be able to make changes, to raise their voices and suggest new ways, to accommodate their dreams, to build out the youth economy where we're able to look at the new things they want to bring to life and provide them with the platforms on which to express it as a business and help them to go global, then we will be destroying our own security as Barbadians because without them engaging and doing well, then we will become old people in a society that is not able to function because we did not properly integrate our youth into our society and into our economy. And that's why I want to particularly congratulate this effort to include the young man, Mr. Koff Dewala, within the political process. I had the privilege and honor of having him speak on my platform. It excited the young people to see him there. Yes, indeed, we had um, persons who were listening. Who is that young man? Um, he, he sounds very, oh, that's the young man, Mr. Koff Dewala. They were very impressed with him, and I was very pleased that he was able to come and share. So I want to congratulate him on that. Now. In relation to the issue of our democracy, one of the things that I was deeply concerned about was the reliance of the, the Democratic Labour Party on the issue of creating a fear that our democracy is at risk, we are losing it, you have to vote for an opposition and so on. The reason why I deprecate that, Mr. Speaker, is because that tactic of fear to make people feel that it is their duty to protect a political party rather than the political party taking responsibility for itself, take responsibility for developing programs, take responsibility to attract to its membership people of quality who when presented before the public, the public could see them as a viable alternative, see them as people who are willing to govern. 
they do not wish to do that hard work, but would rather frighten the people of Barbados into thinking that we have a despotic government, that democracy is at risk. Sir, I feel that what we are doing here is important to demonstrate to Barbadians that their democracy is not at risk. Indeed, sir, as was pointed out earlier, our aim in making certain changes to the Constitution, uh, whether it is to allow a young person to be involved or whether it is to enable and to enshrine in the Constitution the opportunity for the party with the most votes but did not get seats in Parliament to have an opportunity to be represented so that their voices can continue to be heard in this, in, in, within the parliamentary structure is a demonstration of our commitment to the issue of democracy. The challenge that I have experienced and that concerns me as a citizen, however, Mr. Speaker, is the level of disengagement that you find sometimes among people about the political process. And I want to make a document of, of the House, an article by a lady by the name of Elia Somen, who spoke about the issue of democracy. And I want to pull two excerpts from it, Mr. Speaker, because I think it speaks to us and what is happening. And that's why I want to applaud what we're doing in order to scotch the problem which has begun to emerge in our society. She writes, Democracy is supposed to be the rule of the people, by the people, and for the people. But in order to rule effectively, people need political knowledge. If they know little or nothing about government, it becomes difficult to hold political leaders accountable for their performance. Unfortunately, public knowledge about politics is disturbingly low. In addition, the public also often does a poor job of evaluating the political information they do know. This state of affairs has persisted despite rising education levels, increased availability of information thanks to modern technology, and even rising IQ scores. And she goes on to say, it is mostly the result of rational behavior, not stupidity. Now that caught me. How could the disengagement and not being willing to um, look at the political process and be more involved be the result of rational behavior? Because as a politician and as a citizen, I'm deeply concerned about how our political process works, how we work our democracy, and that people are engaged in strong civic behavior. And therefore, the disengagement can be a puzzle to me. But she went on to note a comment by the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. He says, look, the single hardest thing for a practicing politician to understand is that most people, most of the time, don't give politics a first thought all day long. Or if they do, it is with a sigh before going back to worrying about the kids, the parents, the mortgage, the boss, their friends, their weight, their health, etc. Most people don't precisely calculate the odds that their vote will make a difference, but they probably have an intuitive sense that the chances are very small and therefore they act accordingly, that people feel that their vote will not make a difference. And therefore, Mr. Speaker, anything that we can do as a government, that we can do as a country, to broaden participation, to educate people, to share with them, to have consultations, to pull in differing views. All of these things helps to diffuse the political knowledge that people need to understand in order to keep their democracy healthy and strong. Now, Mr. Speaker, from where I sit in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, and keeping abreast of what is happening in countries across the world. I am disturbed by the number of coups that you have around the world, the political dislocation, the foment of unrest, and disturbed by the fact that social media is now being used to destabilize governments, and that people now are at the, the they are literally just fodder 
<coughs> for people to consume politically, to dupe them with public relations, to dupe them with false news and false information in an effort making them pawns in their own bigger games of economic and political dominance in the world. This is very, very disturbing. And the only way we can protect our population from those efforts, and we've seen this with, 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 with the issue of the vaccine. We've seen this with a number of other issues. And the only way to be able to protect our population is to make sure that there's adequate political knowledge and adequate political engagement. And therefore, anything that we do as an administration to ensure that people can participate, that their voices can be heard, that they can get information, it is important to do. That's why the, the Freedom of Information Act is going to be important. We've got a whole suite of um, legislation that we've already passed and will be passed in order to assist in keeping the democracy accountable, keeping it free of corruption, empowering people to have a say and to have knowledge about what is happening on their behalf and what is being done in their name. This is very important, Mr. Speaker. For me, the greatest safeguard in your democracy are the people themselves. The people engaging. And how do they do this? One is the area of watchfulness. Now, I think the watchfulness must go beyond brass tacks. Brass tacks, I think, was probably a good start because we came from a place where people were afraid to speak politically. People were afraid I'm going to lose my job, somebody going to attack me, somebody going to unfair me, and so on and so forth. And brass tacks really helped Barbadians to start to speak out. But then it became a, a hostage then to political actors because some days all you can hear were people B and D talking all the time and trying to sway the public opinion. And the average ordinary citizen stopped engaging. As a matter of fact, I remember when the, the station tried, they said, well, today no political people. Let's just have the ordinary citizen coming up and speaking and sharing their thoughts could not get 10 people to keep the program going. The program was only lively when the political actors stood up and started talking and sharing and so on. And that imbalance at times created a negative effect for the society. So one of the things we have to do is to be able to get past brass stacks. Yes, we need it, but to encourage it to go further and to have other ways in which people can engage the, the, the process of politics. The other thing would be you need that watchfulness, watchfulness by the various organs in society, whether you're talking about the media, whether you're talking about educational institutions like your universities, whether you're talking about associations who may focus on their particular area, whether it is about people being physically challenged, if it's about sports, if it's about business, whatever it is, that those associations begin to play a role in speaking up and engaging the political process. Then there are the trade unions who have a role to play in being able to put the case of labor. Then you have the individual himself or herself engaging in their own right to speak up within that political process. Now, what does speaking up mean? One of the things, Mr. Speaker, that I found particularly challenging in the last term was that in some cases, some of the organs that should have worked were not working as well as they should. There was some indifference to what was happening. Then we had the problem of population having information overload. There was just so much information coming at such a rapid pace, people could not keep up with it, and they weren't following. Therefore, it made it easy for people to come and make claims about the government that were not true. It was difficult to keep up with all of those claims to begin with, to, to be able to correct them, but it meant that people were swamped by too much information that made it difficult for them to assess what their government was doing on their behalf. And it doesn't mean that when they examine it that they would love everything, but at least they should be able to see, know, and understand the truth and come to a conclusion about it. So what is needed? Now, there are some people in our country who feel concerned by the state of affairs in the Democratic Labour Party. And 
my position to them is this. Any healthy organization, any healthy organism always has hygiene processes that work within them. Our own bodies have that. Our, body, our bodies have an internal hygiene process and we have an external hygiene process where we make sure we get a bath and we do all the things that help to keep us clean and healthy and we put on our mask so we don't get COVID. So there are two sets of processes going on. In anybody, whether it's an association, whether it's a parliamentary group, whether it is a political party, whether it is whatever group it is, there must be internal hygiene factors where the people who are engaged in that association are looking and evaluating what they're doing. When they get off track, try to bring it back on track where contending views can be heard and then you are able to arrive at a good conclusion because people have had a say. That's important. The external is equally important where people who are looking on are able to point out when something is going right, when something is going wrong. Internal and external hygiene factors are absolutely necessary for a good functioning association or group. The issue here, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that if we are deeply committed, and that only comes, sir, when you are deeply committed to the philosophy, when you're deeply committed to the vision of your group or your organization, that you will act in a way that helps to keep it on track, that helps to keep it strong and help to keep it vibrant. And I believe, sir, that one of the reasons why the Democratic Labour Party ended where it was, was that their hygiene factors were not working. And so when the deterioration set in, nothing was there to halt it. So that no, the party is so far away from where its founding father had brought it. Sorry. And they have never been able, all they can keep pointing people to is remember our founding father, what he did, how good he was, but cannot point to anything that has happened since then. Why? Because it did not take care of their hygiene factors. Whereas when you look at the Barbados Labour Party, because we do take care of it, what happens? You're able to throw up leader after leader, group after group, that is able to bring something to the table and add something to the legacy. So for Barbados going forward, sir, and I want to end with this, it is very important that we take care of our associations and our groups, keep them clean, keep them healthy, keep them on track. They also need to be inclusive. They have to be able to allow people of um, differing racial groups, differing ages, different points of view that they're able to engage the process and be a part of it. And that's why I'm so proud of this piece of legislation that we're championing here in this uh, honorable chamber to allow a young person to be able to be a part of it. In St. James South, we are deeply committed to helping our youth to participate more within the civics of the country and to participate more within the community. Even this evening, we are starting and launching a mentoring program in which we are going to have people who are willing to learn how to mentor the youth, to make themselves available so that we are able to reach out to young people and help nurture them and help them to achieve the goals which they have. I think that this is extremely important. And I'm looking forward to the programs that are being put on by our Ministry of Youth because I believe that these programs, once we help our youth to engage, will help to keep them on a path that is productive and that is going to bring them to a place of prosperity and success in their lives. And what that will do, that will take care of the future of Barbados and actually safeguard its democracy because we take the time to educate them, help them to engage, help them to understand, and then give them opportunity to be able to express that and to be able to be a part of our future going forward. So I just want to congratulate colleagues on this and thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your uh, patience and opportunity to share those few thoughts. Honorable Senator Michael Sophies. Thank you, um, Mr.